This video is made possible by donations to the United States Lighthouse Society from people like you. Welcome, everybody. It's so so great to see you all again. Just had one of these a, a couple of weeks or so ago, and uh, I've got a, we've got a couple coming up that are pretty exciting that I'll tell you about uh, towards the end here. But uh, I'm really happy about this event we're doing tonight, all about Montauk Lighthouse, one of the country's great lighthouses. Uh, and we have two presenters with us. I'll introduce them in just a moment. Uh, starting out here, I'll, I'll just... Uh, say, you know, well, a little bit more about these events. I was thinking about it. We started them during COVID about three and a half years ago, and we've done quite a few. And they're, for those of you who don't know, they're posted on YouTube. So you can see the past Zoom events on YouTube, and there's a lot of, a lot of great subjects. But, uh, you know, as a lot of you know, it, it was a handy way to do things during that period. But I think a lot of people realize that it's just a great thing to do in general. It's nice to have in-person events and meetings and so forth, but with these events, you can have obviously people from from anywhere can attend, and we can get guests from anywhere. So it's it's very easy, not easy, but uh, lends itself to to doing events like this very nicely. Um, so again, this this presentation is being recorded. It will be posted on YouTube, the USLHS YouTube channel, probably on Thursday. Uh, and uh, you can watch it again or tell your friends. Uh, we'll post, you'll get, if you're on the USLHS email list, you'll get a notice when, when the video is ready to watch. Um, and uh, I'll just mention the YouTube channel has hundreds of videos on it. If you haven't checked it out, check that out. Just go on YouTube and search for USLHS. Uh, USLHS. Um, again, uh, sorry to keep saying it, but just be sure to, to keep your mics muted. And do not share your screens, only the presenters and I should be sharing our screens. So do not click on share screen, please. So I'm gonna introduce our, our presenters in just a moment. Before I do that, I just wanna talk for a minute about my personal experience with Montauk Lighthouse. I was saying for a long time, anybody that listens to the podcast may remember me saying this in the podcast. I was ashamed to say I had never been to Montauk Lighthouse, but, Finally, that changed this past May when I helped lead a, uh, a USLHS tour uh, on Long Island when we went to Montauk. So I don't have to be ashamed anymore. So I have now visited it's one of the most beautiful and historic lighthouses in the country. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm actually going to share my screen at this point and just show you a, a little bit uh, mainly from that, that visit in May. So let me go ahead and share my screen okay okay so this picture was taken that day that our group was there some of our people are in the picture there and you can see that when we visited the lighthouse had not been painted yet it's been recently restored and painted but when we were there it had this kind of rustic look and I thought it looked great like that, but it looks uh, even better with a fresh coat of paint. So the lighthouse is looking fantastic. We'll hear more about that soon. And I'm just gonna play a little video clip here. This is our group at around 30 people. And there's our tour guide, Henry Osmers, who's one of our pre presenters tonight. And Henry couldn't have been a better tour guide. Uh, told us all about the history of the place and showed us around. So everybody had a good time. It was a nice day, a little windy, as you can hear, uh, but just a, a gorgeous day there. And this is in the museum at the lighthouse, and that is the, the beautiful three and a half order Fresnel lens. You're gonna be hearing a lot more about that in the presentation. It is now back in the lighthouse, but when we were there, it was in the museum. I'm gonna play a very quick uh, video clip here. This is one of the volunteers at Montauk. Uh, Henry told me her name is Marty, and she very uh, well, uh, nicely, and 
uh, informatively told us about the lens. So let me uh, play a little clip of that. Inside, we have just a little 40 watt bulb that we use for display purposes. And then when you come over and you stand in the middle there, when you before you go up, you have a look and you can see the power of the lens. That's a little 40 watt. Now see what happens when I close the lens. It's, it gets really big, huge. It's uh, magnified quite a bit. Okay. Now this went up in nine. Yeah. Okay. So be, like I said, you'll be hearing a lot more about the lens. So you can see, I ran up the stairs really fast. <laughs> um, the, something I like to do is just shoot a video going upstairs and then speed it up. It kind of can make you a little queasy if you watch it for too long, but I'm not sure. Henry maybe can tell us how many stairs there are in there, but uh, I tried to go up without stopping, but you can see people coming down at the same time. And some of the beautiful views from the top of the lighthouse is um, pretty much everybody here knows. So one of the great things about visiting lighthouses is climbing to the top for the views. And this is the optic that was there when, I, when we were there in May. This is a VRB25, a type of opt optic that has been used in many lighthouses, but is largely been phased out by LEDs these days. But uh, there is now, uh, there's now been a major change in that lantern room. You're going to be hearing a lot more about that today. So at this point, I'm going to close this and stop sharing. And a whole bunch of people have come into the waiting room while I was talking. And all right. So at this point, I'm going to introduce our presenters, our two presenters for tonight. Uh, first of all, Henry Osmers is going to start off with a presentation uh, largely about the history of the lighthouse. Uh, and Henry has been a tour guide at the lighthouse since 2001. He's the official historian for Montauk Lighthouse. He's written four books. I hope that's up to date. Henry, uh, about Montauk history, and one of them on Eagle's Beak, which I have, excellent book, published in 2008, was the first major history of the lighthouse. Our other presenter is no stranger to uh, attendees of these uh, Zoom events. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you attended our uh, event on November 18th, uh, you saw Dan May do a talk about his uh, new book, Preserving America's Lighthouses. Dan May is a 1979 graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. And during his career as an ocean engineer, he was the project engineer for a number of major lighthouse projects, including a revetment at Montauk. And he has been involved in this new uh, lens project as well. Uh, now fully retired, Re Rear Admiral May and his wife Leslie live in West Newbury, Mass. and Inglewood, Florida. And he is on the U.S. Lighthouse Society's Board of Directors. And as I said, he continues to uh, be involved in lighthouse projects, including Montauk. After Henry and Dan give their presentations, we'll have some Q&A time. A little later, you can ask questions in the chat. Uh, just click on chat and Zoom, and you can enter things in there. But uh, we won't uh, answer the questions until after the presentations are done. And we'll also take some questions verbally. And once more, I'll just request that people keep their their mics muted for now. Thank you. Um, and sorry, I'm I'm doing a, I'm, I'm a multitasking here. <laughs> I'm trying to let people into the event as I speak here. So uh, with that, I think we're ready to uh, turn it over to Henry. And I'm going to be actually be sharing his PowerPoint presentation on my screen. Uh, and uh, Henry will be giving me cues to change the slides. So I'm going to go ahead and and share my screen here. Okay. And hopefully you are seeing the presentation on your screens. And here we go. So Henry, it's all yours. Thank, well, thank you very much uh, and welcome everyone. I we appreciate all of you uh, joining in tonight. Uh, I have been with the Lighthouse since 2001. Uh, I began as a tour guide. I was appointed the historian for the lighthouse in 2009. Uh, I have written, well, you were close, Jeremy. It's instead of four books, it's five, but why quibble? <laughs> They're all about Montauk and the lighthouse. And uh, it's a remarkable place, not just the lighthouse, but the whole area, very unique. 
uh, and the number of steps to the top of the tower to the room where you would look out at the view is 128 steps and then you have the option for six more steps when you can go up into the lantern and look in, and get a nice 360 degree view of the surrounding area which is quite spectacular when the weather is good but it's also really equally as good when the weather is stormy uh, the picture you're looking at right here is an older picture. Uh, you can see the house does not have the traditional Coast Guard look, but that has since been corrected. Uh, the uh, pictures you'll see later on will reflect that. Uh, the, uh, the house itself may, it contains the museum. The entire main floor has nine rooms of exhibits that the visitors can go through. And of course, they can climb to the top of the tower. Uh, the building immediately to the right of the uh, lighthouse itself, the tall building, is a World War II fire control tower. It was equipped with radar to uh, alert uh, the uh, alert the military in the area if there were uh, enemy enemy submarines uh, in the vicinity. And if there were any any enemy vessels in that area, Camp Hero was right next door, which contained uh, several 16-inch guns that could uh, fire up and you know let them go if if it was necessary. Fortunately, that never had to happen out there. But it was part of coastal defense. It was all part of a major operation to protect New York City, which was vital during the war. Uh, this picture, I believe, is from 2009. It really hadn't changed that much until recent events, uh, which we'll talk about later. A lot of the renovations that have gone on have changed the property dramatically, but it looks spectacular today. Uh, next picture. Uh, the need for the lighthouse really came about uh, after the revolution, there were uh, shipping was becoming uh, more uh, frequent between Europe and New York City. And in order to uh, make that trip, they had to sail by the vicinity of Montauk Point. But the problem is, in those early days, there was no lighthouse here or any kind of a signal to uh, give the ship its bearings. And unfortunately, there were quite a number of vessels that came ashore in the vicinity of Montauk, not necessarily at the point, but in the vicinity. And not always with uh, a resulting shipwreck, but it would cause great inconvenience and sometimes damage to vessel, sometimes loss of cargo, and even sometimes loss of life, which uh, caused many ship captains to write letters to the government to get a lighthouse built at the point. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see uh, this is a painting done by Isaac McComb shortly after the completion of the entire project. Uh, Isaac McComb was not the builder of the lighthouse, but his brother John was. Uh, John McComb was a noted uh, builder at that time. Uh, he was he is remembered for building Gracie Mansion in New York City, uh, City Hall in, in New York City, Castle Clinton, a couple of churches and homes. Uh, let's just say that uh, just about everything he built in those days is still standing, and the lighthouse is a great example of that. Uh, in the years to follow, uh, by the oh, by the way, the lighthouse only took five months to build. It was a crew of fifty men who built the ev actually everything you see in this picture: the lighthouse, the house at the bottom of the hill, which was the original keeper's house. Uh, the building to the right was the outhouse. You can't forget that. And just up the hill, just adjacent to the tower itself, was a storage building, which housed the whale oil which was the fuel that fired up the lamps in those early years. Uh, in the next picture, 
you see uh, a painting of the lighthouse that was done in the 1840s. The artist is unknown. It was in the possession of the Gould family. That's G-O-U-L-D, Gould. Uh, one member of the family, Patrick Gould, was a keeper at the lighthouse for about 17 years in the 1830s and 1840s. Uh, and as time rolled along, the, 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 the uh, lighting apparatus and the tower changed, the number of lights changed, the positioning of the lights, the sizes of the lights. It was kind of like everybody had an idea of how to build a better mousetrap. But the biggest change came along with the development of the Fresnel lens by Augustin Fresnel in France. And that, dratic, that dramatically changed the quality of lighting in lighthouses around the world, not just the United States. Uh, we go to the next slide, which was taken in eight, this is from 1860. This is when a, a major modification was made in the lighthouse. The original tower being only 80 feet tall, uh, after the 1860 renovations, the lighthouse was increased to 110 feet in height. And if you look at the, uh, the, di the diagram of the lighthouse on the left, you'll see inside the lantern, this huge lens that is placed in there. That is a Fresnel lens. It was what was called a first order Fresnel, which is the largest one that they made. It depended on the location of the lighthouse and that determined the uh, size of the lighthouse that was required. Some lighthouses were not as critical. Montauk was because it was a, a major promontory open to the Atlantic Ocean and it was vital for the guidance of ships coming in our direction or leaving from our direction for that matter. It's hard to tell from the, from the description that you're seeing, but uh, the lens itself is 12 feet high and six feet wide. So you can imagine it took quite a time for a keeper to uh, polish that lens, which was a requirement almost every day. Because the clearer the lens, the better it's visible to uh, ships and as they're approaching. Uh, the house that contains the uh, museum today, the keeper's dwelling was also built at the same time. And this crew of 12 men built the addition to the lighthouse and the keeper's dwelling itself in just two months time. Next slide shows the lighthouse in 1873. You can see the uh, new dwelling and a couple of other outbuildings scattered around the property. Each of them had their own function. One of them obviously still being the light, the uh, outhouse. People seem to forget that, but you, you, it was part of life in those days. The uh, dwelling itself is a little larger today in 1912, the house was extended out 14 feet on the north side. That's looking away from this view. And that increased uh, the living space for the two assistant keepers that lived in the building with the head keeper. Three keepers lived in the house, uh, a head keeper and two assistants and their families. So they were all comfortably quartered in those rooms. Uh, next slide is one of the early keepers of the lighthouse. This was Jonathan Miller. Uh, quite a remarkable guy from my, my point of view. Uh, he, he was kind of, you know, your his, if you know your history, he was kind of like the Grover Cleveland of lighthouses. He had two separate terms as keeper. And uh, he fathered no less than 14 children. They were not all living at the lighthouse, though. By the time he was there, I believe he only had one child that was of age, as they say. And then uh, uh, he became old enough to move on. But uh, Miller was quite a remarkable keeper, not just because he had the 14 kids, but uh, he fought during the Civil War and had a hand blown off during a uh, confrontation but he was still able to perform his duties. He was one of three 
family members who were keepers at the lighthouse. He had a son here, and then he had a grandson in later years. Uh, the Millers were from the East Hampton area, which was not unusual because in those early days, a lot of the keepers at lighthouses came from the areas in the immediate vicinity. Uh, moving along to the next slide. Uh, I just thought I'd throw this in. This was just one of a couple of wrecks that still happened. Uh, just because you have a lighthouse doesn't mean you avoid having shipwrecks. Uh, the Lewis King was uh, a, a well-documented uh, wreck at that time. It fortunately did not result in any uh, damage, any um, loss of life. Some cargo was Oops. lost, but nevertheless, uh, you know, the, with the assistance of life-saving stations in the area and from the lighthouse, uh, you know, things were taken care of. Moving on to the next one in 1898, this is just a shot of what the uh, lighthouse looked like at that time. You notice the day mark in the middle of the tower is missing. Uh, it was not added until the following year, 1899. Uh, you have the keeper's house in the front. Uh, it's hard to see in this picture, but on the front porch are the residents of the house. Most likely Captain James Scott, who was the keeper at that time. Uh, he was the longest serving civilian keeper at the lighthouse. He was there for 25 years from 1885 until 1910. The building at the bottom of the hill is known as the 1838 building because it was built at that time and it was added to the original dwelling, which stood right in front of it. And the reason the original dwelling is not there anymore is because termites got at it. And that was one of the reasons why in 1860, the uh, new dwelling was built at the top of the hill because the original house was basically just simply falling apart. The 1838 building survives because it was made out of brick. Uh, we have plans down the road to possibly get this building restored and uh, used for purposes relative to the museum. But this is the, what the lighthouse would have looked like when uh, Theodore Roosevelt visited it in 1898, when he visited Camp Mykoff, uh, sorry, Camp Wyckoff, after the Spanish-American War, when his Rough Riders and, met, and almost 30,000 troops uh, came through Montauk as part of a, uh, a quarantine station to uh, treat the men who were suffering from diseases in the war period. Uh, next slide. This is 1903. Just a few years later, you can see immediately to the left of the lighthouse, there's a very tall skeletal tower. That is a Marconi radio transmitter. The building at the far left no longer exists. That was built by the Navy. Uh, the Navy had uh, officers quartered in there who were in charge of the transmitter. Uh, it was believed that uh, the site would have been very uh, effective in terms of transmitting information, uh, except it turned out it didn't transmit very well over land going the other way, uh, particularly to the uh, twin light stations at Navasink in New Jersey. So uh, a mere five years later, the entire tower was removed, as well as the building that housed the Navy. And there's a tiny little building just to the right of the uh, Navy's house there. You can just about make it out. That's called the oil house. They had kept their oil supply in there for the house and for the tower. Uh, that building still exists on the property today. We just use it for storage. Uh, moving into the 20th century, uh, eventually, you know, there was going to be uh, improvements that enabled visitors to visit the lighthouse with a lot more freedom. Yeah, that you can bring that picture back up, Jamie. Yeah, that's John Miller, the second Miller of that family I mentioned before. His time period at the lighthouse was rather colorful because uh, it, if you notice his years, 1912 to 29, 
That included the period of prohibition. And uh, there were stories that uh, indicated that there just might have been some uh, cooperation, let's say, with the uh, keepers of the lighthouse and the uh, smugglers, or the rum runners, we should call them, who were smuggling rum and other liquid uh, alcoholic beverages uh, through Montauk. One source actually said Montauk in those years was simply a wash in rum. Even the minister of the church said he had trouble getting his congregation together because most of them were down at the dock unloading bottles of booze from uh, incoming ships. So it was must have been quite a time. There was even an, a, an FBI investigation in 1925 where uh, Keeper Miller and his son, Jack Miller, who was an assistant at that time, were among those questioned to find out if they were involved. But of course, they did not admit to anything. Uh, next picture. Next picture is in uh, 1930. Uh, this is just uh, to show that by the, by the mid to late 1920s, roads were being constructed out here with uh, adequate pavement to allow vessels to reach vessels, vehicles to reach the point. Uh, some may recognize the name Robert Moses. He was very influential in building uh, highways on Long Island as well as state parks. Uh, the state park adjacent to the lighthouse, Montauk Point State Park, was one of Moses' first projects, along with the Hither Hill State Park a few miles west, also in Montauk. Uh, you can see some lady posing by the car in that picture. Uh, I'm not a car buff. Uh, maybe some people know what kind of car that is. My first guess would probably be a Ford because it seemed like Ford was the one of the first. Uh, but again, that's not my expertise. Uh, next slide shows a, an image from a, uh, an early postcard, which uh, shows what the road looked like coming out to Montauk in 1936. Uh, there were a lot more visitors, and in those days, the lighthouse property was open to the public to come on the grounds. They were not permitted in the building or in the tower, however, but they were allowed to go up the hill and partake of the beautiful views of the ocean and Block Island Sound. Uh, the keeper at that time, next slide, uh, was Thomas Buckridge. He was the last civilian keeper of the Montauk Lighthouse. He served there for 13 years. He had two assistant keepers with him, Jack Miller. That was the third uh, generation of the Millers. Uh, and George Warrington. Uh, they worked together for 13 years and the interesting thing is they never got along with one another, which probably was caused by the fact that uh, uh, John Miller, whose picture you saw earlier, he was the head keeper before Mr. Buckridge came along. And when Miller was in charge, his son was one of the assistant keepers. So I'm sure that uh, uh, Jack Miller was allowed to uh, get away with a few things that uh, Buckridge would not allow. Buck Buckridge was uh, a man who went by the book. He believed that when inspectors came around and they did so unannounced, that he would get all the heat if the station wasn't being run properly, uh, which is logical because the, they're not gonna go after the subordinates, they're gonna go after the person in charge. So Buckridge kind of held uh, Miller and Warrington to task. And Warrington had been there also for a while under Miller. So he was used to doing things a little less uh, stringently, but Buckridge made sure that things were done the right way and thoroughly. And the reason I know a lot of this is because his daughter, Margaret, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> his daughter, Margaret Buckridge, uh, I sat down with her years ago to do uh, an interview 
And she filled me in on a lot of this, which led to a book that I, one of the books that I wrote called Living on the Edge. Uh, and by the way, uh, Margaret is still with us today. She recently turned 104. She is living in Westbrook, Connecticut. Uh, she and I speak on the phone every so often. I like to check in with her. She's, her mind is as sharp as could be. And um, she she's just been a wealth of information to really give uh, real life to the lighthouse as to what went on back in those days. Uh, then the war years crept in, next picture. Uh, in 1942, you see the gradual takeover of the lighthouse by the Army and the Coast Guard. Uh, the three keepers, uh, Warrington, Miller, and War uh, and Buckridge are pictured here. Well, uh, Buckridge is the second from the left in the back. Uh, right next to him is Jack Miller, and on the far right standing is uh, George Warrington. So eventually, by 1943, the civilian keepers were gone, and it was a complete military takeover because we were, well, let's face it, we were at war, and coastal defense was vital. Uh, Montauk Point was one of numerous stations set up designed to protect the shoreline in conjunction with New York City where the Brooklyn Navy Yard was, and there was a lot of work going on there for the war effort. So uh, Montauk was definitely a part of that web. It was known as the Eastern Coastal Defense Shield. So it may not have been the most important spot, but it was part of a network, which was obviously very important. Uh, next shot is a shot of the lighthouse in 1943. Uh, I always present this picture as not being very welcoming, but it's not supposed to be. This is during the Army occupation. Uh, you can see the fire control tower just behind the lighthouse itself. In and it's actually in camouflage because it was equipped with the radar that was used to scan the seas looking for the uh, possible enemy submarines. After the war, the Coast Guard took over the lighthouse entirely. Next slide. Uh, and the first official Coast Guard keeper was Archie Jones. From this point on, you had Coast Guard or Coasties, as they sometimes call them. Uh, they were from the South, mostly from Virginia, the, the Carolinas. Uh, and one of the things is that they, they did a very good job, but they really did not recognize the significance, at least I don't think so. They didn't realize the significance of the lighthouse to Long Island and its, its historic significance. And that'll come into play uh, in a little while when I get to it. But in this picture, you're seeing uh, Archie Jones replacing the light bulb in the tower, quite a big bulb, with a thousand watt bulb at that time. Uh, the lighthouse was electrified, by the way, in 1940. Uh, it seems like a long time for it to happen, but that's just how long it took. Uh, next. Uh, I threw this picture in because the, uh, the little boy standing, sitting on the railing is me. That was my first introduction to the lighthouse with my mother and father in 1957. Uh, I never forgot that day. I still have memories of it. And actually, if you get a really good close look at the lighthouse uh, keeper's dwelling, it is the way it looks today. So we have gone back to the Coast Guard look, including the day mark, which you can see on the tower, the reddish brown stripe, some people say red, some say brown. I just figured, why don't you just say reddish brown, make everybody happy. So um, it, it, we've come to uh, have the property resemble pretty much what it looked like back in those early days. Uh, beginning with the next image, we, we look at the erosion problem at the lighthouse. It was quite critical. 
Uh, when the lighthouse was first constructed in, in 1796, it stood 297 feet away from the edge of the cliff. And just to give you an idea of how severe the erosion was, in this picture, it was estimated to the lighthouse was about 140 feet away. So it was, it was gradually progressing. But in the, in the next several decades, though, any reference to uh, erosion conditions out there never indicated any kind of effort to stop it or to try to do something. They just were basically marking the distance. So as I said, here you're talking about 100 and, uh, 140 feet. Uh, next picture is in 1941, shortly before the US uh, came into the war. And you can see the distance from the lighthouse to the edge of the cliff is a lot closer. You can pretty much see a line running across. Uh, all the buildings you see there are still there, thank God. But the erosion was just a steady progression. And this continued through the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. And as you get to the next image in 1968, this is generally considered the worst that the erosion had gotten. And you can see the erosion is pretty much hugging right up against the uh, lighthouse property itself. You can see the uh, fire control tower has all white paint on it. Uh, that was added on uh, after the war years. Uh, but at this point, the Coast Guard, to, to, to illustrate the point that the, lighthouse, the uh, Coast Guard officers did not understand the significance of the lighthouse, they wanted to shut it down, replace it with a steel tower a few hundred feet in towards the parking lot, which you can see on the left upper left-hand side there in that vicinity. And there was even some talk of demolishing the lighthouse, which really caused a major uproar across Long Island. Uh, a man named Dan Retiner, who publishes Dan's Papers, which is a local paper on the East End for many years, he organized an event called a light-in. And people came, a few thousand of them came out in the late 60s, uh, <laughs> shining flashlights and candles in the parking lot just to show their support to save the lighthouse. And it didn't take much more time for the Coast Guard to realize that they had a hot potato on their hands and they decided they better not touch the lighthouse and thank God they didn't. But then it became a matter of well, what to do, how to stop the erosion. Uh, next slide please and this this person was the solution to the problem. Georgina Reed. Not a government official, not a scientist, uh, a Long Island citizen. She lived in uh, Rocky Point up on the North Shore of Long Island, uh, about two hours away from Montauk Point. She was only about four foot 10, not a very you know imposing figure, but she had it in two places. She had it between her ears because she was very, very intelligent and she had it in her heart. It was a passion. She wanted to save the lighthouse. It was plain and simple, no mystery. Uh, she came to this country from Italy as a teenager. Uh, one of her first jobs in this country was working for uh, a little known politician in this city by the name of Fiorello LaGuardia, also a fellow Italian, also short in stature. So there was a common bond between the two. And I always like to tell people that uh, she learned three things from LaGuardia who could be a tough nut. And these things helped carry her through her life and in her work at Montauk. And these were this, number one, trust in God. Number two, believe in yourself. And number three, you can do anything. And that just propelled her to 
develop a method of terracing that was so effective on her own property in Rocky Point after a, a, a nor'easter in the early 60s destroyed a lot of her land, she succeeded in saving her own property and the method of terracing was so effective that the government gave her a patent. And that's when she contacted Montauk and offered to do a project to save the lighthouse. Uh, you can go to the next picture. The government gave her the permission in 1970 and that's when she began her work. She actually began it on April 22nd of that year which coincidentally was the United States' first Earth Day. I've always said you can't make it up. It just happened that way. And through the next 16 years, this lady led a project here. She trained a group of volunteers to help in the project because uh, she was in her 60s and 70s at the time, but <laughs> quit was not in her vocabulary. She just kept plowing along. Uh, next picture, please. Just a sample of uh, some of the terracing that she and her crew constructed. Incredible work. And it, behind each level of the uh, wood that she put in there, she would dig out some of the soil and plant very hardy, strong-rooted grasses and shrubs that would cause the entire bluff to almost congeal. And that has pretty much held until this day. So this woman was remarkable. Uh, next slide, uh, this is from 1977. This just gives you a little bit, maybe not the best picture, but it gives you a little bit of an idea on the lower right. You can see, if you look really close, that the terracing has been in place. Uh, Almost 1,400 feet really had to be terraced, but in her time here, she terraced about 400 feet of it uh, until 1986. And then one of the volunteers in her group, which was uh, a man, which is a man named Greg Donahue, who currently has, has been involved with the lighthouse now for. Gosh, it's got to be almost 50 years. Uh, he came to Long Island in the 70s, uh, developed his own uh, landscaping business, got in, worked with Georgina, learned about terracing. Uh, Greg would be the first to admit he's a thick-headed Irishman, and he also referred to her as a hot-blooded Italian. But at the end of the day, the two of them got along fantastic. And he learned so much from her. He he will sing her praises to this day. And Greg himself was also instrumental in the new seawall that was built around the lighthouse in the last couple of years, uh, keeping in the tradition of the work that Georgina Reed started. Uh, next next shot up, just an example of some of the plantings that were done. You can see the the incredible thick growth that, that developed because of the plantings that Georgina had done. Uh, you can see the tower on the upper left and that's the fire control tower at the very top to the right. Uh, in the 1990s, the Army Corps of Engineers came out here and with other organizations, they built a seawall consisting of 20, uh, next slide, I'm sorry, I should have said that. The, uh, the project involved the placement of 28,000 tons of boulders all around the point to shore up the bluff against uh, wave action that would undermine the cliffs around the lighthouse. That went on for a few years and the, the terracing and the rock revetment were both completed by 1998. So the next two images you're going to see, I like to call them a before and an after. If you could go to the next one first. This is the year before Georgina Reed came to the point. This is what the lighthouse area looked like at that time. Uh, you can see rocks on the beach 
Uh, they were actually dropped there right after World War II to act as a deterrent to erosion, but they really didn't do all that much. But over the years, they ended up collapsing into the beach area and they actually helped act as a foundation for the new seawall that came in in the 90s and the current seawall that was put in in the last couple of years. So now that you've seen this image, now go to the next one. Quite a change. You can see the, the rocks, I always like to say they almost look like a perfect set of teeth, but that's the way they were designed. They weren't dumped there, they were placed, which makes it very significant. Uh, this is not a completion picture. You can see it just says after 1995, uh, the rocks have, the boulders will continue to run all the way along the beach, almost to where you see the tower of the lighthouse. You can see other rocks in that area. Eventually they would all meet up and that would happen in 1998. So we should show these two images in the museum just to show you just the transformation. Uh, next shot, the next few pictures are, just designed to show you some examples of when the new seawall was being put in in 21 and 22. We went from 28,000 tons of boulders to 125,000 tons. The rocks came from quarries upstate New York. They were trucked down to Montauk Point. They were 3,000, roughly 3,000 truckloads of rocks brought here. And some of the rocks were as much as 25 tons. And again, they were placed, they were not dumped. And we are told that they will be significant in holding back the effects of erosion, probably until the middle of the next century, which is pretty remarkable. We're talking $30, $40 million worth of work here, Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, it, it was quite a feat. Fortunately, the weather was uh, our friend for most of the time. They were actually uh, four months ahead of schedule when they finished the entire wall. Uh, next picture, please. This was the staging area on the west side of the lighthouse property. This was land that was originally on the state park and town of East Hampton. We actually borrowed that land to use it as a staging area with the agreement that we would green up the area once the property was, once the project was finished, which we are currently in the process of doing. A grass is growing back in there and will continue to do so. The rocks were dumped in this area and then transported to where they were going to be placed. Uh, on the beach. Next shot. Uh, next couple of slides were taken by uh, the tour guide you saw on the video before, Marty. Uh, when she was up in the tower, she took some of these shots to show the activity of the uh, cranes placing the rocks as we went around the point. Uh, next shot. Uh, you can see here the, the rock wall is pretty significant compared to the old wall. But again, the weather was uh, our friend for a lot of the time and we were able to uh, really uh, finish up ahead of schedule. Uh, next shot. Yeah, this is just a still shot. This green green, tra green crane was uh, really a bear. This thing did the... Uh, at least from my perspective, it was the bulk of the work of placing these rocks. And uh, Greg was extremely instrumental in the uh, placing of these rocks without question. Uh, next one. And you can see another view. This is the last of the slides. Uh, now the, the seawall itself was just one of the numerous renovation projects that the lighthouse has undergone in the last couple of years. Uh, 
the seawall, yes, it was probably the, the one, one of the ones that was most in focus because a lot of visitors remember the old seawall and they were quite amazed at the new one. Uh, some of the other projects that went on was that, as I mentioned earlier, the house was, the keeper's dwelling was restored to uh, its original Coast Guard look with the white shingles and the red roof. We, we had a front, a new front porch built on the museum, which was made out of Ipe, which is a Brazilian wood, which is considered extremely durable, which is what we needed. In the fire, I'm sorry, in the fog signal building, which is actually a, between the lighthouse and the um, fire control tower building, we have a virtual aquarium exhibit installed in there. It's part of what we call the Oceans Institute. So that was also put in. And the fire control tower itself, you can probably see it from the, the uh, a little bit from this uh, image is it was restored as well. Uh, some of the rust, the rust was removed from the exterior of the tower and a new paint job was put on it. So there was a lot of work going on at the same time. But the one project that seemed to bring a lot of attention to people was the return of the Fresnel lens to the lighthouse lantern. Uh, and you can see that here. Uh, this is the, 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 the land, the lens is in the tower. It's a good shot that also shows you the lighthouse being restored to its uh, Coast Guard look. Uh, the light that shines from the tower now lets people know that there really is a lighthouse at Montauk Point. It's not a weak pencil-like signal as the uh, old, the, the Vega did its job for, you know, for a number of years, but it, the, the beam that's coming out there now is indicative of the kind of light that Fresnel envisioned way back in the 1800s. Uh, and if you continue to the next slide. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> okay, these are just a couple of shots that were taken from our recent Lighting the Light. We do an annual event every year at Thanksgiving weekend. Was kind of a perfect night. You can see the moon just came up, just in the right position for some pictures. We we believe we had a record number of visitors for this evening. This was the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Uh, probably close to six to seven thousand visitors came here that night, and the weather was again very cooperative. So it it's been a stellar year for the lighthouse. It's had a lot of improvements. We're hoping for a tremendous year in 2024. And I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Admiral Dan May of the Coast Guard, who really was quite instrumental and supportive of us in getting our, our Fresnel lens back. And uh, that's basically my story. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, excellent presentation. You covered as a good overview of the history of the place, and there's a lot of history to cover there. Uh, so yeah, we are going to turn it over to to uh, Dan May at this point. And again, some of you saw Dan just uh, three weeks ago, something like that. Uh, so you're familiar with him and the great work he does. Uh, so Dan, it's it's all yours. So you're going to share your screen for this, right? I am. Okay, and thanks, Henry. That was great. Uh, quite the history. Uh, looks like it's disabled, uh, Jeremy. If... Oh, right. Sorry about that. <laughs> I forgot to click something here. Just give okay. me a moment. Okay, now you should be able to do it. There we go. All right, so hopefully everybody is seeing that. I've, I've titled my piece here, uh, Relight the Light. And uh, uh, Henry gave us a great history. It is the fourth oldest lighthouse in America. And it's one of the only 12 national landmarks um, lighthouses in the, uh, uh, let's see, let me get back here. Um, uh, let me get back to our, here we go. These.
All right, so let's get back here. Yeah, Dan, if you here want this, go. there you go, yeah. So um, as I said, mine is relight the light. And uh, in order to tell the story a little bit, uh, we got to go back in time and uh, it goes back to um, in 1996. And one bit uh, that I'll mention at the outset here, um, this is a good news story, obviously getting the, the lens back in the tower, uh, but it's also a story of um, how, uh, and folks that know me and the projects that I've worked on throughout my career, it was always a challenge and it was always my challenge to try to find the collaborative, the win-win, uh, to think a little bit creatively and to find ways to get folks to work together. So the story starts back in 1996, shortly after the Montauk Historical Society had taken ownership of Montauk Light through the uh, National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act. And the president at the time, Dick White, um, started uh, figuring out, okay, how are we gonna tell our story and how are we gonna have the museum and all the different things. And they're sitting in the, uh, in the keeper's uh, house there was that three and a half order Fresnel lens. It had now been sitting there uh, since 1987 when it was taken out. And Dick said, you know, it would be neat if we could somehow get that lens back in the tower. And so the story actually starts there. And uh, let's uh, talk a little bit more about the, the lens. So here it is. Um, it's a three and a half, which I think is a pretty rare lens. Um, I'm not sure how many of these were built, but not that many. Uh, I've been around all over the country, all over the world and, and seen various lenses. You will see some of these. They're called a clamshell or bivalve because of the two uh, identical shapes on either side. It's made to rotate and flash on those uh, out of those two sides. Uh, this particular lang lens, like most of them, manufactured in Paris. Uh, this is a Barbier, Bernard, and Turin lens. And if you read a little bit on Fresnel lenses, um, BB&T, as they were known, was probably the premier lens builder at the turn of the century uh, in the world. They were really the top of the line, if you will, in Fresnel lenses. And uh, having seen this lens for more than 30, 40 years now, almost, and um, worked with it, I can attest to that fact. It's absolutely a phenomenal lens. Um, as Henry mentioned, it operated from 1903 to 1987. Uh, about a 20 nautical mile range. Um, it alternated in signals. It was a flashing uh, 10 second at one time, went over to flashing five second, which is where it's at today. As you can see in the picture to your left, it sits on a platform that is sitting on a drum or, or a basin, if you will. Uh, that is essentially a tub within a tub and the material between the two tubs is mercury. And mercury was chosen uh, as the material because it had the lowest coefficient of friction uh, known to man at that time. And it was used in these lenses because it would allow these lenses to rotate with practically no uh, wear, no friction whatsoever. Um, this lens was totally restored in 2022. I'll jump over here to the next slide um, and talk a little bit about why reuse the lens. A lot of people have asked that question. Uh, the photo there is the lens up in the tower. But um, as I got involved around the fall of 2021, um, at that time, the Montauk Historical Society, they had been working for 10 or 15 years with this dream, if you will, of trying to get the lens back in the tower. Um, that was not an easy uh, process to, to uh, take on. And the Coast Guard uh, really did not want to go back to the Fresnel lens. 
It was about modern technology. Their main concern for that is because of the maintenance required in maintaining uh, the lack of expertise that existed throughout the Coast Guard. So um, there was a real reluctance that um, Montauk uh, folks ran into in trying to get this project going. So I came on and, and we talked about all the ways that we might be able to do this. And as you can see here on the slide, we started talking about all the reasons that would be beneficial in restoring the lens. And uh, once it was restored, um, Jim Woodward, a uh, Lampus uh, totally restored the lens in 2022. It was in great shape, but it needed a little bit of work here and there on some of the prisms and some of the framework. Um, but it was really a fantastic lens. So why not use it? Uh, again, I mentioned a National Historic Landmark, putting the lens back into the tower really adds to that historical characteristic of the lighthouse, especially as a national historic landmark. That lens can be seen by the public. Um, you don't have to go inside to see it. You can see it quite well uh, in that 110 foot tower. So you're gonna get greater visibility. And then Montauk had sat down and made a pitch to the Coast Guard that they would take on all of the maintenance, all of the upkeep for, uh, for the lens for the future. So that made it a little bit advantageous to the Coast Guard. Um, but there were some other concerns that the Coast Guard had in trying to put a Fresnel lens back in the tower. And so we started working with the Coast Guard to see what their concerns were and how we could mitigate or try to abate those concerns. And one of the things that the Coast Guard shared with us is they really had a strong desire to do some data gathering for the Fresnel lenses. There's about 50 Fresnel lenses that are still operating today as Coast Guard aids in navigation. There's a bunch more that are private aid to get navigation and other privately owned lighthouses that operate for now lenses. So um, this was really groundbreaking in, in that sense in that uh, we thought, hey, here's a great opportunity to really partner together. And this is where that collaborative uh, creative thinking came in. And the more we talked about this, um, we said, hey, how about let Montauk be that uh, innovative uh, test, if you will, pilot program, as the Coast Guard is calling it, to really see. And the Coast Guard, the more we talked about, they really saw uh, that that would be a huge benefit, uh, not only to the Coast Guard, but to lighthouse groups uh, all over the country, if not all over the world. So uh, it just proves to you that when you start working together, thinking, kind of outside the box and thinking creatively, good things will come of that. I've been convinced of that my entire career and it uh, has worked out very well. This is another one of those, like I said, good news stories. So let's see what the, um, the biggest concerns were. And this is the things that we tried to work through uh, with the Coast Guard. Obviously the biggest concern for them was temperature, humidity, um, what happens, uh, and for most folks, I think, understand, uh, I learned this early in my Coast Guard engineering career, uh, lighthouse tower is basically a chimney, and cool air is at the bottom, and the warm air is at the top, and to really have a good structure, and to maintain that structure, the mortar, everything about that, uh, Montauk is built on a sandstone, which is a very soft material. So you have to be very careful in how you work in that lighthouse. But as you can see in the drawing here, I'm depicting cool air in the bottom coming up as it rises up through the tower. It warms, and we all know warm air rises, and then it exits out through the vent system and, and the vent ball on the top. So what uh, we started working with some other engineers and some folks in the industry to see what we could do to mitigate those concerns that the Coast Guard had. So we came up with three, three things to do that, and they met the criteria for the Coast Guard. So the first one 
I show you up there on the left, it's a new UV prevention uh, film. It's made by 3M. Um, it's called a Prestige 90 is the term for it. Basically, it cuts down 99.9 uh, of, of UV rays coming in to the lantern room, but it absolutely allows 100% of that light to exit the glass. So it's the perfect material to protect the inside of that lighthouse and the lens from the harmful effects of UV, but it allows 100% of the light to be emitted through the lantern room, which is exactly what you want. And then we also came up with a um, system called a direct air control. It's uh, referred to as a DAC system. It's essentially an air conditioning and vent system. I'll show you a couple of pictures in a minute. Uh, but that moves the air through that tower. And you can either cool the air when it's hot or you can heat the air when it's cold just to keep that flow of air. And then uh, working in conjunction with that system, is an entire uh, computer-based uh, automatically, it's called a room alert. Uh, it monitors, you can add as many as 12 to 15 different sensors to it. So we can measure the temperature, the humidity, uh, everything within that tower, we can monitor. It goes to a computer web-based system 24 hours a day. We can control and keep track of everything in that tower. Um, so when we presented this to the Coast Guard, uh, they were thrilled, uh, they were very satisfied, they were happy, they thought this was a great way to go, and they essentially approved us to move forward. Um, here's a couple of pictures I'll show you real quick of the DAC system. We used an existing window, so there's no penetrations, uh, so our State Historic Preservation Office was very pleased with the installation. This is the uh, DAC system in the lower window here I'm showing you. And then this is the exterior side. There's the vent. Um, unless you knew what that was, you'd never know the difference uh, in that vent system there. And uh, as you can see, that was prior to the repointing and the painting. And then I show you a picture over on the left of the, of the tower, 110 feet tall. So a lot of air to be moved there but um, the DAC system does that for us and uh, does it quite, quite well. So um, now once we got the Coast Guard approval, it was a matter of, okay, let's, uh, let's take the lens and get her to the top. Uh, a lot uh, easier said than done, but I'll walk you through the steps here. So here we go. Um, disassembly, uh, that was the first step. We had, um, and Kurt Fosberg, uh, uh, that's him in the side of the, the three and a half there. He's a certified lampist and was the guy who came up with a new pedestal. Um, you'll see in a minute the old pedestal. We did not use that. And then also, um, I think Alex Diaz is with us tonight. Alex, thanks for joining us. Uh, Alex is from Rhode Island, Ponham Rocks Light came down to help. And then Jason Walter up in the right uh, is uh, the site manager for Montauk Historical Society. Um, I got my hands in there whenever I needed to, but it takes three or four people at a time. Uh, as I say, my mother used to tell us all the time as kids, many hands make light work. And I uh, took advantage of a pun here, but uh, really you, you got to do this piece by piece by piece. And here we go to the right. There it is. Uh, one each, three and a half order Fresnel lens, piece by piece, disassemble. And the uh, pedestal to the left there. What we found in our research here is that this was not part of the original lens. This was built by the U.S. Lighthouse Service, probably at Staten Island, back at... Uh, probably sometime in the 20s or the 30s. The clockwork mechanism, you can see a little bit there in the bottom. Uh, we decided not to use any of that because it really did not have that much of a historical value. And we wanted to design a new system 
that would give us a long-term better uh, rotation system. Obviously, we couldn't use the, the Mercury anyway. Uh, so Kurt came up with a new design that we installed. And then, uh, so once you've got it all in pieces, uh, this was the old, as uh, I think Jeremy showed us, the old Vega VRB25 and the old pedestal. We took all that out and we had to take some of the grading out as well. So this was a week long project. Uh, probably that's about the minimum time I think you can do something like this. It was a whole day just to get that lens apart a whole day to do that. So you really have to have a good plan, do your homework, plan it all out day by day, and then take it slow and steady is what I said. Uh, uh, Alex can probably attest to that. I said that a thousand times that week, slow and steady is the way to go. Um, here we are to the left. Uh, that's the new pedestal designed by Kurt, already installed. We took that up first. You can see we've removed some of the grading there. And then you can see the crane in the background. We had a beautiful day to do this, thank goodness. Um, Montauk is a very big, uh, windy place. And then uh, Jason Walter and myself came up with this uh, tub you see here. Uh, we yeah, lined it with uh, styrofoam and then we built a bed. That's literally a bed of blankets in the bottom and each piece went in piece by piece uh, to lay in that nice bed. And then let's see if I can click on uh, a short little video here. And this is how we went up uh, very slowly. Again, slow and steady. Uh, you can hear a little bit of the wind blowing, but that tub worked perfectly. We weren't sure exactly uh, how that was going to work. We had looked at a couple other things that we were going to use. I've used a number of different ways to get pieces to the tower, but um, this really worked ideally and it got it right up. And the other thing, if you noticed in there, um, up at the tower, we had to take uh, we had to take the lantern room doors off, the cast iron original lantern room doors we had to take off, and we had to take out uh, a little piece to where we could get uh, out onto the catwalk, and then all you had to do was just reach over, as you can see these two gentlemen here, all you had to do was reach over into that tub and take the pieces out. So it was a very well orchestrated, very well uh organized process to to do that um i'm going to move on here to the next slide and here you go once you got it back up piece by piece on the left you can see you just reassemble it again just like we did taking it apart and then um kurt uh, uh did a little cleaning for us uh, once we were up there just to clean it all and I'll tell you what, to look at that lens right there in that picture, I caught the sun. I took this picture just as the sun was coming through. Um, 120 years old. I uh, hope we all look as good when we're 120 because that, that lens absolutely looks gorgeous. And then I've got a couple of more. The Coast Guard worked with us very, very well. They agreed to relight it. And what you're looking at right here is a safe light uh, LED. The actual lamp is in the center, the yellow, if you can make that out. That's the actual lamp itself. The two big black um, devices there, those are heat sinks. That LED generates so much heat, you have to dissipate that in a way. So they use those black uh, uh, heat sinks to do that. That lamp um, is totally controlled by a computer. Uh, right now, it's only at about a 50% intensity, which gets us back to that almost 20 mile range. But we could crank that up a little bit more, uh, almost double uh, if the Coast Guard wanted to. And the, uh, the price tag on that lamp was $16,000 for that one LED lamp, $16,000. And uh, it was nice of the Coast Guard to do that. You can see on the right there, we've got it lit up. And then I'll go to the uh, one more slide here and I'll play a couple. 
this is the bearing. This bearing here you see, and um, Kurt designed this. It's a unbelievable design that will last uh, at least 50 to 75 years long after we're gone. But let me play this for you. You can see how this how this rotates. It's a six six RPM, so five five second flash. Um, keeping with the uh, characteristic, and then I'll play this one for you. This is with the LED in it, um, and you get an idea with the light in it, what it looks like. And then one last slide. Uh, oop, there we go. Um, one of the things I did throughout my Coast Guard career, it was kind of like the uh, the old saying of the um, uh, the proof in the pudding is the taste. Well, for me, whenever I worked on lenses, lighthouses, anything, I would always have um, uh, the Coast Guard uh, go out that night once we were done and take a look at it to really see uh, what it looks like from the water. Uh, in this case, the Montauk Historical Society um, chartered a boat and we took about 20 of us out that night and uh, the shot on the right uh, was just about almost sunset. When we were going out, we came out of the harbor and went around the point and I came by the point, I was able to catch the uh, lens just as it came by. And then the shot to your left is taken uh, in total darkness. So you really do get the, uh, the feel of how that lens creates that uh loom if you will of sweep of light coming across so there she is uh it was lit on november 6th uh so we're coming up tomorrow will be uh 30 days and it's all been working extremely well we are going to continue to monitor that and we'll share that with the coast guard but uh it couldn't have gone uh any better uh than uh, we've got here so uh i was very uh, honored and proud to be part of the project and uh i hope uh i hope others uh, can learn from this and we'll see where we go with this effort but hopefully it'll be a very very uh, productive and positive test and i think i'll stop there and we'll see what we have jeremy for uh, uh any folks that have questions for henry or myself Sorry, I have myself muted again. Uh, great, Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, you might want to stop. There you go. All right. Uh, fantastic. Congratulations to you and everybody involved in that project. It's just, it's amazing. And all of us Lighthouse fans are, are so happy about it. I was thinking a couple of things while you were talking. One is that uh, I've heard it. I, I, I didn't make this up. I heard somebody else say it once that it's nice to see lenses, Fresnel lenses in their natural habitat. You know, lenses and museums are nice. You get a nice close look at them, uh, but uh, they deserve to be in their natural habitat when possible. And it's kind of like seeing an animal in the wild versus an animal in the zoo, I think. So, <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was really nice. And um, uh, three and a half order lenses, Hospital Point Light in Beverly has a three and a half order lens, but it's a very different, it's the more beehive style. Beehive, right, right. Yeah. But it is a three and a half order. Toledo Harbor, Ohio has a three and a half order lens. I don't, I don't know offhand what that one looks like. And I think there's a couple, at least a couple of others on the Great Lakes. I don't know if there's any other three and a half order bivalve lenses. I, I don't. I, um, I've been down to Hillsboro. Hillsboro is a second order uh, rotating a bivalve. Uh, absolutely, again, gorgeous lens. But mm -hmm. uh, I have not seen another three and a, three and a half rotator. Yeah, uh, I've seen some others around, but. Uh, Pretty, pretty amazing lens. Yes, I it think is. From, I think from what I've read, I think the three, the three and a half orders seem to predominate in the Great Lakes yeah. for some reason. Yeah. yeah, the Hospital Point and Montauk are the only ones I know of in the eastern part of the country. Um, so uh, another thing I was going to mention is that as we were talking, Dan, I, was, I did a quick Google search looking for three and a half order lenses. And I see that there was a, I guess, Harbor Light some, quite a few years ago made a, a yeah. small re replica yes, of the Montauk yeah. lens. Looks really nice. Yeah. And it lights up 
and uh, I could see you can get it on eBay for 135 bucks, <laughs> which I think is a lot less than it originally cost. Um, also, uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. We'll take those. But uh, you mentioned Alex Diaz is here with us. And Alex, uh, no pressure, but I want to invite you, if you want to say anything, uh, you can. But here's, here's a plan. I'm, we'll take the questions in the chat first. But if uh, Alex or anybody else, you want to say something verbally, go uh, under uh, down the bottom of your controls and click reactions. And you should be able to click raise hand to digitally raise your hand, virtually raise your hand. And uh, I'll call on you. You can unmute your mic if anybody wants to do that. Um, and also, uh, Monsieur uh, Augustin Fresnel is in the audience as well. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Monsieur Fresnel, I'd invite you to say something if you'd like to also. But let me look in the chat for the questions. I know there's a, a few in there. Um, uh, Josh Liller uh, has made a few interesting questions and comments. My friend Josh from uh, Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse in Florida. Josh says, can visitors go inside the fire control tower? What's the answer to that, Henry? Uh, the, the fire control tower is not open to the public. The, uh, the steps in there are extremely steep. They're wooden steps. Uh, there's really not really space in there for any kind of exhibits. You know, so it, it's never been open to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh also was asking about the rotational system, but I think you, you covered that, Dan. Um, let's see. Well, uh, John uh, Canetta said Kurt Fosberg did a fantastic job on our lens of the Crooked River Lighthouse in Carabell, Florida. Uh, Kurt is a great lampist. I've uh, met him a couple of times, interviewed him out in uh, Marquette, Michigan last year, and uh, also uh, did some video of him at Palmer Rocks Lighthouse in Rhode Island uh, not too long ago, and he does a great job. Josh says, uh, Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse has had great success with UV film on the lantern glass for probably almost two decades. Uh, and <laughs> Monsieur Fresnel uh, says, Magnifique. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to hear from him. Oui, oui. Yeah. <laughs> Dan said the Montauk three and a half order lens rotates at six RPM. For com This is Josh again. For comparison, Jupiter has a first order lens that never had a mercury float, so it only rotates at one RPM. Yeah, that, and that's something uh, I went back through uh, again, uh, great resource that the United States uh, Lighthouse Society have. I went back and uh, looked, uh, we have light lists that go back to um, the early uh, mid 1800s and through the 1900s. Montauk was actually a 10 second flash. And uh, we're talking about that with the Coast Guard, whether eventually down the road, more for historical purposes, whether we might want to go to a 10 second flash. But um, right now it's operating great uh, with the six RPM motor, the five second flash that keeps it that way for the Mariner because the Mariner has pretty much come to know this as a five second flash so um and it's uh it's working great the uh, motor assembly it's a a dayton motor uh available from granger just about anyway the pieces kurt did a phenomenal job putting it all together we were early on we were debating how we would do it whether we would try to use the old system or not and back and forth but the more we discussed it uh kurt came up with an outstanding design and it's uh, working fantastic actually i have a question dan i have a question for you sure uh when they first uh made montauk a flashing signal this is going back to 1858 they started it at the beginning it was every two minutes Can yeah you can you ever explain a rationale behind waiting two minutes for the next flash? <laughs> it might have been just the technology they had at the time to, in order to flash it. And I saw a question in the chat on Beehive. Most Beehive lenses do not flash or are flashed electronically in today's world. But most of the old Beehive lenses were fixed. In fact, uh, Montauk, from my research, 
uh, as Henry showed us back in 1860. Um, and that is, uh, I think I mentioned this uh, a couple weeks back, Ira Wynn, that is an Ira Wynn lantern room uh, built specifically for a first order lens. And so that beehive lens had a flash panel that rotated around the fixed light. That's right. Uh, yeah. And that's what you'll see mostly in beehive lenses. So uh, that's the main difference between a beehive lens and a, a clamshell. Clamshell is designed to rotate. And they that's all they do is rotate and flash. Um, it was really kind of a uh, more of a modern invention over the beehive lens. They came latter after the beehive were the first lenses to come out and they were mostly fixed uh, lights. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to call on uh, Mr. Fresnel wants to say something. So I'm going to call on him in just a moment. But I, I love this comment from uh, Alma in the uh, chat. First order presentation by Henry and Dan. That's a <laughs> nice way of putting it. Great, thank you. Uh, thank she you. also says uh, John McComb built the old Henry, old, old Cape Henry Lighthouse in, in Virginia, which I just visited in October. And she's absolutely right about that. It's another great piece of work. And they're, they're very similar tower, uh, paint, not painted the same, but very similar. Um, there are, a couple, I think there's at least one more question in the chat, but. Uh, Monsieur Fresnel has his hand raised, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, let him say what he would like to say. The Excuse night me. of glory has arrived, and out of the darkness shines a brighter light. I am so proud and so honored that the three and a half clamshell lens is back in the lantern room at Montauk Point Lighthouse. And as you can tell by the photo, I had the uh, pride and uh, great love to uh, do the performance and share my story with the people of Montauk on National Lighthouse Day. <laughs> and uh, it's a good thing I did it when uh, the lens was still in the museum. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I would have to climb all those 129 steps. So <laughs> anyway, I... Uh, I really enjoyed this presentation, Henry, Dan, just a great job, everyone involved. Uh, it's just such a, a wonderful um, testament to the passion and dedication uh, of everyone in the Lighthouse community uh, that is involved. And Jeremy, thank you so much for bringing this presentation to all of us. It's just wonderful to see this. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fresnel, I should say, uh, Joseph Smith, your alter ego. Um, so thank you both for being here tonight. And I don't know if everybody could see the uh, the lens uh, picture behind him with uh, the time uh, Fresnel gave his presentation at uh, at Montauk there. Great, <clears throat> great picture. Let's see, somebody's, Tom, Tom Pregman. Did you yes. want to say something or? Yes, I did. You can go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. I was recalling the, uh, Bivalve uh, lens that's in the Navasink lighthouse in the <clears throat> in the uh, uh, the old factory building out back. First order. First, first second order. order. I thought it was the first order. Well, hmm. it says here in the uh, write up with the uh, that came with the harbor light of Navasink that hmm. uh, Comet 1840 Commodore Matthew Perry returned from France with two brand new Fresnel lenses. Although Europe had been using modern devices for years, America was soon about that. The following March, a fixed first order lens was installed in Navasink's North Tower, while a revolving second order Fresnel lens was in the South Tower. <clears throat> America's experiment with this new beehive lens was a resounding success, impressing all but the most skeptical observers. Now, I didn't keep reading now the whole thing, but it's that's now maybe it changed over history and maybe that's not the same lens that's um, still currently there yeah i'm pretty sure it's a first order but i'm just quickly looking well, on my yeah, phone to see if i can lights right yeah up, I do. yeah I uh that lens i have some personal history with that <laughs> that lens that's on display at montauk when i was a kid growing up near boston that lens was on display in the boston museum of science 
Mm. And uh, I think that may have inspired me to get interested in lighthouses because I was just, as a little kid, I was blown away by that that lens. Made a big impression on me, but it it, does, it belongs back at the uh, where it is at the site there. Um, so let me see. Uh, um, Gina uh, asks question to Jeremy or Henry. Why is there? Well, and Dan also. Uh, it's a really good question. I'm not sure I know the answer. Why is it a three and a half order lens? Why, why isn't there a two and a half order? And why not just use a fourth order lens? And I'm not sure there's a definitive answer to that, but Dan or Henry, you want to try? I'll, I'll defer to Henry. I, I do not have any specific answer other than uh, if you look at the lighthouse board, which would have been the body that made those decisions back in the day, <laughs> They um, made these decisions uh, based on what they felt uh, was required at the time. And, uh, uh, you know, kind of tough now to go back uh, most of these 100, 120 or more years and figure out what went into their reasoning. But Henry, maybe through some of your research, you might have come up on something. I, I have not, other than those were the decisions made by the Lighthouse Board. I would pretty much concur with you. Uh, I believe that it had something to do with the distance of from where the light source was to the prisms. And I, I think there was a, a, a gap, I think somewhere between the third and the fourth. And I think they must have felt that maybe if they had a three and a half, it would, it would be it would suffice, right, you know, to fill right. that big gap, because there right. are no other halves anywhere else. That's the only one. Yeah. And just for everyone's uh, edification, the distance from the light source to the, the, the radius, if you will, or essentially diameter, that distance is what determines the size of the order, as, as Henry was saying. So they must have felt that a third um, uh, was uh, not enough, and a second was too much, so they went with a three and a half. Sounds good so, to me. Yeah, um, me our too. friend, our friend Sally Snowman, uh, soon to be retired uh, keeper of Boston Light, uh, posted an interesting comment. His uh, split rock in uh, in Minnesota has a three and a half, uh, but I think it's actually a third order. Pretty sure I was there not too long ago. Pretty sure it's a third order, but it's still it's the only Fresnel lens in the country that still rotates on Mercury to the best of my knowledge. It's not an official aid to navigation. They turn it off, turn it on for several, you know, special occasions occasionally, but it does still rotate on Mercury. I believe um, that, that, I believe that's the lighthouse they, they uh, activate once a year for the Edmund Fitzgerald wreck, which yes. uh, Gordon Lightfoot did the song for. That's mm -hmm. absolutely correct. Even yeah. though the wreck happened nowhere near there, <laughs> happened, I think I think it was hundreds of miles away, but still it's a nice, nice thing to do. It's a dramatic um, location too. Oh yeah, it's an incredibly beautiful place. Uh, ben asks, what are the pros and pros and cons of the clamshell versus beehive style lens? That's a good question. Um, again, while well, you were saying, Dan, that most beehive style lenses are fixed, but there are quite a few that have the round yeah. flash panels. And uh, it depends. I mean, Boston Light is a beehive lens, but it's flash panels and uh, rotates on chariot wheels. Um, I guess the, the main difference in my mind is uh, clamshell lenses are designed specifically to rotate as opposed to beehive, unless they had flash panels. So it's one of these things where uh, a beehive lens uh, could be made to flash. If you look at um, uh, Black Island Southeast, that's a first order beehive lens. And I, I talked about that uh, back in November. Uh, that is flashing green. Uh, and I believe it's a five second flash as well. You can see it from Montauk quite well, uh, by the way, but um, that's flashed electronically. So uh, back in the day, most beehives were all fixed and the clamshells were all flashing. That was the primary difference. Today, 
uh, with modern technology, you can just about do anything you want to do. You want to do uh, if you're willing to uh, come up with the right electronics and the parts and the pieces to make it all work. Mm -hmm. Josh Lillard has made a couple of inter more interesting comments in the chat. By the way, Josh is historian at the Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse and one of the best lighthouse historians around. He said, Jupiter, Cape Canaveral, and Pensacola lighthouses have fully rotating beehive style first order lenses. I think there's some on the West Coast as well. But, um, and then he says, Navisync got its bivalve lens later. Neither of the original 1840s Fresnel lenses were bivalves. I don't think bivalve lenses existed until mercury floats are invented yeah. to make them practical, which is in the late 1800s. Right. That, mm -hmm. Um. I think we want to wrap things up soon, but there's a couple more questions in the chat. Isn't there a clamshell? Whoops, my chat just uh, jumped up on me. Uh, isn't there a clamshell lens at the National Maritime Museum of Ireland in Dublin? Dub Dublin? Yes. Also, there's a, a large, I'm trying to think of what order it is. A large, I was in Dublin last year, so I saw that. But in um, uh, the uh, Whitefish Point, Lighthouse Shipwreck Museum at Whitefish Point Lighthouse in Michigan. There's a large bivalve lens on display. And uh, I know my friend Nick is in the audience here. We went there together last year. Uh, I think that may be a, a third order, but it's beautifully on display. It's really high up when you go into that museum. So there, there are other bivalve clamshell lenses, but I think they're, I mean, uh, large, you know, third order or, or larger clamshell lenses. Um, mm -hmm. that's, da, 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 da. And Hill, Hillsboro Light in Florida is a second order uh, clamshell. Beautiful, beautiful. It's in operation. It was lit with an LED as well by the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, that's still a navigate, uh, aid to navigation. It was converted from a mercury bath to a um, uh, electric motor and a little bit different uh, design than what uh, Montauk is. Obviously, a, it's a larger lens, but um, that's a beautiful lens. If you do get uh, down to Florida, that's you can see that well outside the lighthouse as well. That's a beautiful lens. Uh, you can see it rotating up there. Beautiful clamshell lens. Mm -hmm. Nick, uh, Nick, my friend Nick Korstad just reminded me in the chat, the lens I was talking about at Whitefish Point is a second order lens from White Shoal Lighthouse in Michigan. Uh, yeah, I wasn't, I couldn't remember if it was a third or second, but it's, it's a gorgeous lens. Um, so I think we want to start thinking about winding things down here, but there's just great Henry and Dan both did a great job and it, it dovetails together very nicely. I want to mention that, uh, we have two more of these virtual events scheduled. On January 20th, we'll be doing one with Ford Reiki, the owner of Halfway Rock Lighthouse in Maine, very remote, wave-swept lighthouse. He's done an amazing restoration there. Uh, and uh, on February 10th, we'll be doing one with Dave Waller, the owner of Graves Lighthouse in Boston Harbor. So I think of those as, as like companion pieces. They, uh, they're very similar to each other, and both Ford and Dave are very creative businessmen who've uh, just uh, pulled off incredible restorations of those places. Uh, I'll also mention that I'll be leading a, a co-leading a Southern Maine and New Hampshire tour for the U.S. Lighthouse Society next October 6th to 12th. I know it's a long way away, but we're working on the details and want to watch for that. I hope we'll see some of you on that tour. Mm. So uh, unless uh, Dan or Henry, I want to thank you again and give you a chance if you want to add anything before we sign off here oh. go ahead henry well i just want to say it was an honor to be here and, and, and talking about our lighthouse uh, yeah being a national historic landmark makes it so significant and uh, i think uh, the montauk historical society has done so much to uh uh bring that fact out to the public that it's it's a very special place it's very historic um, it's special to long islanders in particular it's been the official symbol of long island for decades uh, and uh, 
just having opportunities like this to uh, tell to tell our story is uh, is just amazing. And uh, it was an honor to speak uh, alongside uh, Admiral Dan. I mean, thank you. It's always oh, good to pleasure. have you. My pleasure, Henry. Thanks. Same here. It's an honor for me to be uh, part of this and help uh, help Montauk achieve this great feat. And my thanks to Jeremy and the uh, Lighthouse Society for hosting this. This is uh, it's really groundbreaking. And it, to me, and uh, as I travel around the country and uh, help and work with other lighthouse groups, uh, I think this is really. Uh, opens the door for some some opportunities elsewhere around the country. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that all works and continues to work well at Montauk. And we'll see where this leads us. Absolutely. Yeah. And somebody asked me to post the dates I just mentioned for the upcoming events in the chat, which I did. But uh, if you're on the USLHS list, you'll be getting emails about that. So just it's not 100% uh, definite uh, those those events, but pretty sure we'll be doing uh, Ford Reiki on J January 20th and Dave Waller on February 10th. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. If we don't talk to you before uh, Christmas and the holidays, we wish you all the best for the season and a happy new year as well. And we'll see you uh, around the lighthouses. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, thank, right. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.